Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. So the name of my talk here is Using Game Theory to Explain Psychopathology. And I'm wondering, as a psychiatrist, how do you feel about that title? <laughs> well, let me tell you how I feel about that title. I've given this talk to groups of psychiatrists, and I've given this talk to groups of mathematicians. And when I give it to a group of psychiatrists, they say, great talk, merging psychiatry and math, that's fabulous. Could you leave out some of the math? And then when I give the talk to mathematicians, right, they say, that's a fantastic idea, emerging psychiatry. Could you leave out a little of that psychiatry? <laughs> and then just as I was coming up here, I had this interesting experience. Jonathan, the previous speaker, asked me as we were in the wait, uh, waiting area, he said, so who have been your influencers? And he stymied me, because I was sure he was thinking about someone like Freud or Jung. And I was uh, stymied for a moment. Then I realized my influencer, the person who's been most important in this work, is actually the person from uh, the Beautiful Mind, John Nash, um, who was advanced game theory um, and showed how game theory can influence a lot how people make decisions and how people behave. And uh, two years ago, I was invited to give this talk at a game theory meeting, and I actually got to meet John Nash. He unfortunately passed away, as you all know. And so um, he actually turns out to be uh, one, of, one, of, one of my influencers. Uh, so in this talk, I, I am going to get into a little bit of mathematics because I need to do that in order to really make the argument that this makes, uh, that this, this makes sense. But I promise it won't hurt. <laughs> this intro is kind of a summary of the, um, of the whole talk. And it sounds strange to talk about psychiatry and mathematics. Isn't psychiatry about emotions? Isn't economics about money and rational calculations? So how does mathematical economics or behavioral economics have to do with psychiatry? Can psychiatry be rational? Can economists be emotional? Well, it turns out that both fields are really about how we make decisions. And there's a new field called behavioral economics. And behavioral economics has brought together many of the fields that deal with decision making and shown us how there can be common ground. Since this is going to be a little complicated, I'd like to give a little bit of directions and outlines. I'm going to talk about what behavioral economics is. How did that come to be, and how is it becoming a bridge? Um, how it's influencing psychiatry? And then I have to give a little bit of a lecture thing here, because in order to make my argument, I've got to teach you a little bit about how decision theory works, a little bit of how something called delay discounting works. And that's how we trade off enjoying life now or enjoying life later. And then finally, we will get to my main example, which is how anorexia could be actually a decision problem. OK, so both economics and psychology have always dealt with human behavior. But economics, it was very theoretical and dealt with mathematical models. You ask an economist, and he'll tell you, um, yeah, these models are really, really beautiful. He say, well, it doesn't really fit reality. He says, I don't really care about empirical reality. These are beautiful mathematical models. If you ask a psychologist, you know, they'll say, no, I'm not interested in beautiful models. I'm interested in what the research tells me. So that was the situation until behavioral economists came along and tried to build the bridge between these two. Behavioral economics focuses on decision making, as I've mentioned. And it's an extension of economics by including psychological experiments. What's the main point of it is people are kind of rational. And so I can start with these mathematical models as long as I adjust them. OK, what does that have to do with psychiatry? Isn't the whole point of psychiatry that it's emotional? Well, not really. First of all, as Newton taught us, mathematics is the measure of how scientific a discipline is. And psychiatry has tried to get scientific for a long time. So decision making seems to be important to all behaviors. And even those are involved in psychiatric problems. So since decision making can be made mathematical through economic modeling, um, maybe this is the way that we can pull it all together. So the key to understanding decision models, however, and here's where we're getting a little bit of a little lecture on decision models, is that when you make a decision, we actually have internally in our brain a kind of a, a th something called a decision tree. And I'll show you that in a moment. And the three things that are important there for us is that we have decisions. And what are those decisions about? They're about value, timing, and uncertainty. Here are the questions we ask ourselves. What are my choices? That's the overall choice structure. What will I get? What's the probability that I'll get it? And when will I get it? Now, here's an example of a tree. This is a tree decision that many of you may have faced this morning. Do I take an umbrella or don't I take an umbrella? Well, you can make a decision about those actions. But notice, you can't, you can't make a decision about the outcomes. The outcomes are up to this probability, right? All you can do is take 
a decision, and then there are different outcomes. You may end up in, the, in rain with an umbrella. You may end up no rain with an umbrella. But you could also end up in the great situation where there's no rain and you're not carrying an umbrella. So you've got to sort this out. It, I, so I actually originally wanted to do a complete analysis of this for you, but it takes about an hour. It's actually a, a complicated problem is to analyze, analyze this fully. But notice that if you and I could figure out what the numbers are here, how much value each of these things has relative to each other, I could solve this problem. And let me show you that we can do that in other cases. Here's a simpler case. I have a decision about who is rational. If someone offers you a lottery, and the lottery ticket costs a dollar, and the jackpot is $10, what's fair odds? In other words, what's the minimum probability at which you would buy it? Another way of saying that, what's the tipping point for you? Here's the uh, tree, right? I have a decision to make. Don't gamble, I keep my dollar. I'm ahead a dollar, or I gamble. Then I have some probability of winning it, but I could win $10 or end up with nothing. I think we all know that a fair gamble in this situation is a 10% chance of winning. Why? Well, intuitively, if I do it 10 times, I probably win once, right? And then I'll get $10, I will have paid out $10, so it's a break-even point. And that's the intuition. Economists have taken this a step further and have a kind of more sophisticated way of thinking about it, which comes to the same thing. They say that there's something called expected value, and that is the value of the event times its probability. Let's look how this works. If I don't gamble, I keep a dollar with 100% probability. So that's an expected value of a dollar. If I gamble, I win $10 with a tenth probability and zero dollars with nine tenths probabilities. Hey, that also is an expected value of a dollar. So it's the same argument, but a little bit more formal here. Both choices have the same expected value, but only when the probability is equal to one tenth. Now, some of you are sitting there and saying, Larry, this is nonsense. People don't just bet with one-tenth, and the whole lottery industry is there because people bet, right, when their odds are far against them, right? Far against them, not when it's just an, a, a, fair, a fair bet. And that's exactly where behavioral economics comes in and says, you know what, there's something else going on, and that is when I lose, I don't just get zero dollars, I actually get the thrill of having played the game. So that's where behavioral economics brings in things a little bit more complicated, whereas this would be a traditional, purely economic model. So we have to talk about one more thing before we can get to our, our psychiatric example, and that is this notion of delayed discounting, which is we're always taking into account when do I get the reward, not just what the reward is. Delaying gratification is the mirror image of impulsivity. In both of them, I weigh smaller rewards now against larger rewards available later. And this idea of delayed discounting is, eh, is everywhere. So different people do it differently. Some people are very impatient. If you say, I'll give you 50 cents now instead of a dollar tomorrow, they'll say, I'll take it. Other people say, no, I'd rather wait. And they will only take maybe 99 cents today instead of for tomorrow. So people have a different notion of trading off the current value to future value. And this is represented, the different things are represented by what's called the discount value, which we put our little thing on called delta. It's math, so it's delta, right? <laughs> um, so delta times value is the present value of a future reward. Somebody owes you $10 tomorrow, he says, hey, how about I give you $9 today? Then you would have a 90% discount value. You say, you know, I'll take it because I'd rather have it today than wait. We good with that? Okay. No. So how about anorexia? Does this have anything to do with this kind of thing? Well, I'm going to argue that it's actually a complicated decision problem. Let's treat it as if it were rational. People sort of say, well, this is psychiatric. It's a psychiatric problem. Let's see how far we can get if we think of it as a rational decision. But it involves something interesting. It doesn't involve a single choice. It involves a sequence of choices. Anybody who's dieted normally or been stuck in, unfortunately, stuck in an anorexic problem knows that it's about sequence of choices. So let's think about somebody who has anorexia. They have to think about a sequence of choices. And for each outcome, they're going to have a value, or economists say a utility, maybe the utility of eating a piece of cake. Mm, delicious piece of cake. That's a utility to eat it. Or the anticipated utility of losing some weight. Here's what it would look like. Let's walk through this quickly. I can eat, decide to eat a piece of cake now or not. I can abstain or I can eat. Let's say I abstain. Well, then I'm going to face another piece of cake because, as I just said, it's a sequential decision. If I abstain the second time, I end up with weight loss from two abstentions. But it's in the future, so it's a delayed value of weight loss in two abstentions. Okay, and there's some probability that I will abstain next time. Okay, 
if I eat, then I, don't get the I do get the reward of this piece of cake. Maybe next time I'll abstain. And then I get the weight loss from that abstention. And that has a different probability. So the important thing here is that as I'm thinking about making these decisions, I'm also thinking about the next time I have to make this decision. And in the mind of a dieter or in the mind of an anorexic, the probability later on of abstaining is helped by the decision I make now. I'm, unlike the rain situation where I make my decision and then nature chooses the probability, I feel I can influence that probability. And that's the key that the decision tree gives us to the whole issue, that I actually believe as I set up my decision tree that I'm influencing future decisions. Now here's the mathematics part. We can go through this quickly. It seems very technical, but it's actually just sixth grade algebra. I'm just naming things. It's everything that was on the tree before, I simply give it a name. And the reason I give it a name is because if I give it these names, I can also give it these numbers, right? F is going to be the value of eating cake. That has a certain value for me, okay? Delta F, as I said before, that's the value of a future piece of cake, okay? W is gonna be the weight loss value to me. So each of these things has a value. And if I rewrite the last tree by simply putting these things in, notice these things turn into numbers, and I can solve this. Boom. I can take that, that tree and I can solve it by setting one branch of the tree, the expected value of one branch of the tree, equal to the expected value of the other branch of the tree. And mathematics is magical. It gives me this equation, which I call the starvation equation. What does this say? The starvation equation says, forget the part in the middle for a moment. It says, look at the discounted value of the future weight loss. If that alone is greater than the value of cake, I'm abstaining, right? If, I, if it's so important to me to lose weight and that weight alone is, is larger than the value of the cake, I will abstain. Fantastic. But you know what? Even if it isn't, even if the temptation of the current piece of cake is not by itself greater than, than, than the cake, I have this other thing going on in my head, which is the excess expectation of the future abstinence. That also has value for me, right? So, not, so the cake is so tempting that I think, well, but if I stop eating this cake now, I'll also be able to not eat the next piece of cake, and that has value to me. And if those two values together outweigh the temptation of the cake, I can abstain. So that's a good thing if I'm dieting, but it can also be a bad thing if it's too rigid. So what helps me abstain? Even if the temptation is great, that is delta W1 is less than F1, that says the temptation is great. See how the math and the emotions come together, right? The temptation is great is represented by that. I nevertheless can abstain if my delta, if my discounting is greater, or if this expectation of the future, of the future value of the next piece of cake is greater. I can still abstain. So the larger delta is, the more one values the future, the larger W2 minus F2. That is the, the, the amount that my weight loss is greater than my enjoyment of the cake. And the larger P minus Q is. All of those things help the equation tilt me towards abstaining. Because P minus Q is how much probability do I increase that I'm going to abstain next time. All three of them characterize this, and all three are about the future. So what is anorexia, according to mathematics? It's valuing weight outcomes more than consumptive ones. It's discounting less. It's caring for the future more than the present. It's about sequential decision making, and it's about using current decisions to bind future actions. So I need to understand anorexia as rational behavior involving a decision to predetermine future decisions. It's a commitment to behave in certain ways, and it's the taking on of an identity as a dieter or as a restrictor if it goes too far. So sometimes these well-intentioned commitments of making a, uh, a, taking an action that commits me not only to the, not eating the currant cake, but binds me to the idea of changing my peas for the next time, binds me to the next decision, they can become too important and I can get locked into them and that can become a problematic anorexia. So I need commitments in life to be able to diet, but I also need to have them be flexible. So is there such a thing as mathematical psychiatry? I think we've shown that behaviors that seem a far distance from rationality and mathematics can actually be both. And I hope that you come away thinking that you never underestimate the power of mathematics 
to elucidate the world, even the world of the troubled human heart. Thank you. But I want to leave you with, with Emily's poem, which is this. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side. The one will the other contain with ease and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue. The one will the other absorb as sponges buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for heft them pound for pound, and they will differ if they do a syllable from sound. Thank you so much for your attention.